They are called gamines. Their age, as young as five years. Their home, the streets and sewers of Bogota. Their specialty, surviving. In a modern city of over four million, they are a city within a city, a subculture of 10,000 orphans, runaways, and children of the streets. By day, they roam the streets in small gangs, begging, pilfering, and stealing. By night, they huddle together for warmth and protection. These are the children of poverty and prostitution, the victims of parental neglect and failure, imprisoned within the walls of hunger, disease, drugs, and sexual abuse. They live and die on the fringe of society, the edge of despair. And yet these children continue to cling to this tragic way of life because it is a freedom of sorts. Freedom from parental cruelty and neglect, freedom from all restraints and control. Only a miracle could change their lives. This is the story of that miracle. His name is Padre Javier. They call me Padre Javier, my boys in Bogota. I'm a Salesian priest, a missionary. But to the Gaminas, I'm a friend and a companion. One they can come to for help unconditionally. No questions asked. It took time and patience to break the wall of distrust and suspicion that naturally separated us. We live in different worlds, and the Gaminas are always suspicious of anyone who might try to change their way of life. Though theirs is a life of hunger and sickness and vice and violence, it's the only life they know, and they cling to it for all their worth. But I have a dream to help these children escape the tragedy of their tortured lives. When I see them living day after day in these inhuman conditions, my heart goes out to them. And I want to help them become happy, healthy, normal children. When a Gamine finally comes to realize that his greatest problem is that he is unloved, that no one shows him affection or respect, then, and only then, is he ready to make the fundamental decision to change his life. That's when he must have an available alternative. We offer him that alternative. A life of friendship, the dignity of work. This morning, I'm taking some of the Gaminas to spend a day in the country, a world that many of them have never seen.
Every time we take one of these trips, I think of how it all began. I was 40 years old then. I had been a prison chaplain in Bogota for 17 years, but I was not reaching the boys. It finally dawned on me that I didn't really know them. And the only way to learn was to share the life of the Gaminas in the street. I put on my blue jeans and spent days and nights going about the neighborhoods frequented by the Gaminas. I sat on curbstones, talking with the boys and listening. I found Gaminas old beyond their years and scarred by their street life. I learned that their values were all rooted in the struggle to survive. Most of all, the boys treasured their freedom. Freedom from parental authority, from work, from school. Don Bosco, the founder of the Salesians, used to say, if you want boys to rise to your level, you must first go down to theirs taking an interest in what they like. That's why today, when we're going on this outing, we sing and play together. We're friends and enjoy each other's company. And it's at times like this that I see the basic human goodness of the Gaminas, not the hardened criminals that other people take them to be. Perhaps my vision is colored by those earlier days when I went everywhere with the boys, into the sewers, into the dope dens and the thieves' market. And I watched the Gaminas ply their trade in the noonday streets, where traffic jams and crowds of shoppers made purse snatching and pickpocketing almost easy. I shared the food scraps they scrounged outside large cafeterias and saw the filthy theaters where they spent much of their free time. In the marketplace, the Gaminas are expert thieves. Each one has his own specialty. Watches, rings, glasses, wallets, shoes. And the thieves market is always ready to receive their loot. Lose an item in the evening, and you'll almost certainly find it the next day at one of the market stalls. The Caminas are fast workers and they drive a hard bargain. With this kind of life, is it any wonder that the boys are exhausted? This trip today brings out the best in the boys. Just as my first outing with 30 of the worst boys in prison did, six years ago. The prison director laughed and called me a dreamer when I planned that first trip. He was sure that the boys would take advantage of me and all run off. But just like these boys today, they enjoyed being out in the open, swimming and singing and experiencing a special kind of camaraderie. And in the end, all 30 in that group of six years ago stayed with me for the return trip to the prison. Yeah. 
Relating to the Gaminas like this taught me that any kind of program to help these boys would have to be inviting, not coercive. It would have to respect their personal freedom. To give boys like this a choice, to treat them as persons who could be responsible for themselves. Such an approach was unheard of. In those early days of planning, most people thought I was crazy. But my life with the Gaminas in the streets built up a relationship of trust and confidence. I couldn't drive anywhere in the city without the Gaminas running to me. And the boys always turned to me when one of their own was sick or hurt. On this day, Miguel had been preyed upon by an older man. When the boy resisted these advances, he was forced to drink a quart of cheap rum. Miguel spent the night in the street, naked but for a bit of sackcloth. Fortunately, we were in time to get him to the hospital, and he lived. I come across cases like this at least two or three times a week. Sometimes my help comes too late. boys from outings like today's and from my experience in the streets, the more convinced I became that I could never mix all the Gaminas together in one place or in one kind of program. As vagabonds, they tended to be undisciplined and selfish. The only way to help them would be to lead them one step at a time at their own pace into another kind of life. With this in mind, and with the help of friends, we opened our first Liberia, or Liberty House, a place that the boys could choose to come if they wanted to try a new way of life. But they had to want to come. So today's outing, like so many before it, comes to an end. I say a fond goodbye to my Gaminas and distribute a few pesos. Hopefully, these will provide at least one meal for which the boys do not have to beg or steal. As the boys leave the warmth of the bus, I want so much to ask them to come home with me to enter the program, to a new life, a life with a future. But I know that that's not possible now. Today is only a beginning. Perhaps when some of the Gaminas get to know us better, they'll decide that they want a new way of life. In the meantime, it's not easy to see them return to the wretchedness and crime of the streets. After the last boy leaves and I go home, I can't help thinking of them, of the empty lives they're leading in the streets. There's little to show them that they're persons of worth before God and man. Like unwanted animals, the Gaminas return to their haunts, to their cardboard mats. sewer hideaways. Victims and victimizers, they band together to shut out loneliness and fear. It's no wonder then that each night as I prepare to sleep, my thoughts are with the Gaminas, 
they too are preparing for bed, but unsheltered and uncared for, alone in the night. And I'm haunted by their loneliness. I pray and I hope and I look to the morning. Perhaps there will be some new faces among the Gaminas who leave the streets and come to our gates asking to join our programs. I'm rarely disappointed. Today is no exception. Among this morning's visitors, there are several I've never seen before. Any Gamine under 15 years of age who comes to this gate can take part in our daily program. He can stay for the whole day or leave as he pleases. Many come from the streets just to participate in the games. Others are looking for help, for food, medicine, a shower, a haircut, or just companionship. This kind of day-to-day -day encounter can set a boy thinking about making a change. The playground is a happy place, but noisy. The directors guide the Gaminas toward fuller involvement in the program. Those who want it are treated to a shower. Their clothes are washed and returned clean after the boys have showered. It's useless to provide new clothes. In the evening, when the Gaminas return to the streets, they would only sell them. For many, this is their first real experience of cleanliness and joy. In time, they make friends with others in the program and are soon asking to be taken in. We put them off at first. Adjustment to such a new way of life can be difficult, even traumatic. Without real desire and determination to succeed, premature entry could spell disaster for a boy. When we think a boy is ready, he's invited to live in our dormitory. Like parents who love their children, we keep no records of the boy's past. We're concerned only in their present and future welfare. Once a boy chooses to live with us, he's constantly learning, not from textbooks, but from a new environment of cleanliness, joy, and trust. The dining room is a good example of this kind of learning environment. Instead of the usual institutional tinware, we use china and silverware. In this way, little by little, the Gaminas see that there's another way to live and do things. Bedtime here is a marked contrast to nighttime in the streets. Independent as these boys are when they're outside, they often take a long time to feel at home here. And bedwetting is a common problem. A result of the insecurity and lack of affection in their infant years. Everyone, old and young, understands this. So there's patience and respect, and no mention is made of it. But when it stops, we know the boy feels at last that he is truly loved and accepted. I still remember the first night I saw my Gamina sleeping in real beds. 
After all the years of working with these boys who'd stolen and taken drugs and even become involved in violence and wondering what could be done, here at last was a beginning. As I looked at the boys resting quietly, tears came to my eyes. Our basic approach is one of love and hard work. Work is therapeutic. It helps a boy learn that he has value in himself, that he's not just a beggar, that he can do things, can grow and achieve. The process includes craft work and tests for manual dexterity, as well as the ability to work with different tools and materials. The boys take great pride in learning new skills and in making a good product. They like to see their efforts produce something useful. It suits that sense of the practical that they learned in the streets. In the same way, the mobility of our beginning programs takes into account the restless lifestyle which the Gaminas are used to. Today, Miguel and Carlos, two new boys in the program, are going with me to see the places where they will live and work. They sleep in one place, study in another, and work at a third location. This makes their adjustment a bit easier. First, there is Arcadia, built by the boys themselves. Forty boys board here, and over 200 are bussed in to work and study in the agricultural school. Most of the boys who come from the streets are illiterate so they're put with others who know how to read and write. The professional staff is careful to observe the kind of classes a boy chooses and the kind of assignments he does best. They take their cue from the boy's interests in their efforts to affirm him in his personal growth. Each boy progresses on his own at his own rate of speed. Our schools are not at all formal. Group interaction between the instructors and the boys, always on an equal basis, is the cornerstone for learning and for mutual respect. Out here, the boys are learning to cultivate flowers. It's a useful skill, one that teaches what it means to nourish life and beauty. It's an experience that can prepare the boys for spiritual growth. They're not required to adopt our beliefs, but we gladly share with them how much our faith means to us and invite the boys to join our church services and to study religion. The basis of Don Bosco's system and the secret of its success has always been reason, faith, and kindness. Eh? We take great pride in La Florida, the final stage of our program. It's a self-governing boys' town. The boys live and have their meals in small residences that accommodate 15, with one boy in charge. By popular election, the boys choose a mayor and four assistants who direct departments such as finance, education, and discipline. At La Florida, a boy earns his way. Nothing is given free. 
Each boy is paid for his work. He's taught how to budget his money according to his needs. If he will not work, he must leave. But even this decision is made by the boys themselves. In this setting, responsibility and community awareness cannot help but grow. So impressed has the government of Columbia been by our program at La Florida that it contributes in part toward its daily operating expenses. We must raise the rest. 1,200 Gaminas are now in the program in our eight locations, with more entering every day. And it's worth all the effort. As I look around at the faces of all the boys gathered to elect their mayor, it's hard to recognize in any of them the lonely, hardened urchins that they had all once been. And it's almost unbelievable to see and hear them talk of themselves as responsible citizens and leaders. When Don Bosco was asked, what was the secret of his success? He replied, my system is very simple. It consists in using reason, faith, and kindness. As for details, we go ahead as circumstances dictate. I don't wait for evil to happen. I stop it from happening, crowding it out with play, work, study, and prayer in an atmosphere of joy and serenity. Six years ago, I hardly dared to dream that all this could happen. Could my programs for the Gaminas really work? I was confident, yet hesitant. I experienced the greatest joy of my life, the day I realized that my theory of love and freedom for the Gaminas was really working. Here in Bogota, the spirit of Don Bosco and the goodness of God lead us on to dream and to hope. I'm Father Edward, the director of Salesian Missions. The successful program you have just seen is an example of the worldwide effort of 40,000 Salesians to bring hope and dignity to the poor, especially the young, and to inspire them with a living faith. If you would like to be part of this dynamic work through your financial support, or if you would like to become a Salesian missionary, Write to Salesian Missions, New Rochelle, New York. God bless you. Mm -hmm.